بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله الحمد لله حمدا يوافي نعمه ويكافئ مزيده وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما يا كريم رب شرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي رب زدني علما رب زدني علما رب زدني علما اللهم لا سهل إلا ما جعلته سهلا وأنت تجعل الحزن إذا شئت سهلا Tonight we're talking about a topic that I believe is relevant to every one of us And not every topic is relevant to everyone Because if a person is not a person of a family Then if we talk about family life It's not going to be relevant directly to them at this moment If we talk about marriage and someone has already been married and it's been 30 years or 40 years and they've already discovered every secret of marriage, it's not the time for them to find these things out at this moment. We talk about youth issues, elderly are not going to get affected. So they will not really benefit directly because it's not a topic directed to them. We talk about business and we talk about transactional law, people that are not in transactional law, they're not in business, they're not in uh, trades, uh, they're not in uh, trading rather, they will not be affected by this topic. But this topic, I believe, is something that can affect every single person. And it affects not only human beings, but all creatures that can think. And this is the topic of arrogance. Of arrogance. And when a person begins to deem himself to be greater than other people, other creatures, other beings... This is a sickness that shaitan had. This is a sickness that Abu Jahl had. This is a sickness that Abu Lahab had. This is a sickness that Fir'aun had. This is a sickness that the greatest sinners of this humanity had. This is a sickness that every one of us has a potential of having. Because when a person begins to see himself as self-sufficient, when Allah grants them and grants them more, when Allah gives them all sorts of uh, na'im, all sorts of blessings and ni'am, when He's granted and granted and granted, He starts to believe Himself the source of this grant. He starts to believe Himself the reason for this grant. He starts to say, as Qarun said, إِنَّمَا أُوتِيتُهُ عَلَىٰ عِلْمٍ عِنْدِي All this wealth that I've collected, i had been granted it because of a knowledge that I had, not because Allah had granted this to me. So when a person has al-istighna, inna al-insana la yatagha, man begins to become transgressive against his own soul and oppressive against his own soul and arrogant. When he begins to see that he is now, he is now sufficed. He has all of his needs fulfilled. So kibr is a sickness that any one of us can be affected by. Even those people who have nothing can have kibr as well. Because they may look at something they have and believe it to be greater than everybody else. And that would be a source of kibr for them. So in arrogance, it's not a condition that you have something. But rather you believe something that you have to be greater than something that other people have. And maybe you might have an individual who's completely poor and completely weak and completely sick and completely everything, but still he finds within his, uh, within his self, within his being, something that he feels makes him greater than other people. Perhaps it's his mind. You have people who are on wheelchairs, but they're disbelievers in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You have people who are on wheelchairs and they die like that and they're not able to move. But they're the leaders of those who disbelieve in Allah Rabbul Izzati Wal Jalal. And if you know who I'm referring to, you know who I'm referring to. You have people like that in this world who are like that, that they are the leaders of those who disbelieve in Allah. Those who basically place the theories down to make people disbelieve in Allah those who disregard anything that leads to the belief in Allah, but they have no might, they have no strength, they can't speak, they can't walk, they can't do anything. And that's because man has the ability to be arrogant about anything that he has. And, and that is why this is a very severe and important topic. And it's an important topic because the Prophet ﷺ, he said that, the, that Allah Rabbul Izzati wal Jalal himself said, a hadith ilahi or a hadith qudsi? That... 
Al-Izzu Izari, the might happens to be my my Izar, my lower garment. And Wal-Kibriya Uridai. And arrogance, greatness, Al-Kibriya, arrogance and greatness. It, ha- it happens to be my upper garment. This is Allah speaking. It's a metaphor, of course. It's not like Allah has a lower garment and an upper garment. That's not what's meant, meant over here. It means Allah is the one who is the most deserving of might. And Allah is the one who is most deserving of, of considering Himself the most supreme. Allah is deserving of that trait of Al-Kibriya, of greatness, of feeling that He is great. Allah is deserving of that trait. And Allah, He then says in the hadith, فَمَن يُنَازِعُنِي أَحَدَهُمَا فَقَدْ عَذَّبْتُهُ Or in another tradition, فَقَدْ أَدْخَلْتُهُ النَّارِ أُدْخِلُهُ النَّارِ That whoever tries to take one of these two away from me, or whoever tries to get a piece of this, whoever feels that he is deserving of this, then I will punish him and I will enter him into the hellfire. So this is a trait that belongs to Allah al-Kibriya. Allah is al-Mutakabbir. If a man happens to be Mutakabbir, he's going to fire. But Allah is al-Mutakabbir. So you can be the slave of the ones who, one who happens to be Mutakabbir. Because Allah is truly belonging of this quality, that He is the supreme and above all, that He is greater than everyone else, that He has the feel that He is recognized to be greater than everyone in every which way. Those who happen to have kibr, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala punishes them. And the first of those punishments is a punishment that Allah gives them within this life. Allah says, سَأَصْرِفُ عَنْ آيَاتِي الَّذِينَ يَتَكَبَّرُونَ فِي الْأَرْضِ بِغَيْرِ الْحَقِّ I will turn those people who do takabbur, who are arrogant within this land, I will turn them away from my ayat. I will turn them away from my signs. I will turn them away from the meaning of the Quran, meanings of the Quran as well. So those people who have takabbur, they're not able to understand the words of Allah properly. Even if they assume that they've understood, Allah says He will turn them away from the meanings of these books because Allah doesn't like these people. And He tells us of this also in the Quran. When He says, Inna Allah la yuhibu. Ah, what is He doesn't love? There are many things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't love. But one of those things is Allah doesn't love the mustakbirin, those people who have kibir, those people who believe themselves to be greater than other people, those people who find within their, uh, their, uh, their miserly selves and their meagerly selves and their weak selves and their temporary selves, they find within that some reason for them to deem themselves greater than other people. So Allah doesn't love this character and Allah doesn't love these people and Allah punishes these people. And the Prophet ﷺ, he said in a hadith, he said that لا يدخل الجنة من كان في قلبه مثقال ذرة من كبر The person who has even an atom's weight of kibir within their heart, this person is not going to Jannah. My brother, this is a very serious matter. My sister, this is a very serious matter. If it's your wealth that leads to your kibir, then recognize that you are going to die and most of the wealth that you have belongs to other people who are going to take that wealth from you when you die. If it's your body that makes you feel like you're greater than other people, then recognize that you started your life off as a weak person, unable to do anything. You couldn't even raise food to yourself. And there will be a time where you will be weakened again by Allah Azza wa Jal. And that weakness is bound to come to every person unless they die before that weakness. So it's either death that leaves you completely unable to do anything or it's a weakness that awaits you in your old age. Those are the, two, those are the only two options. There's not a third. And so if it's your body that's leading you to having kibr, then recognize your body is coming to an end. If it's your mind, then you die and the brain is no longer functional anymore. If it's your looks, there's going to be wrinkles upcoming very soon. And there might already be here. Anything that you have, you're going to lose it. Anything that you have is temporary. This life as a whole happens to be temporary. My dear brother and my dear sister, what benefit do you have in takabbur, in deeming yourself greater than other people? What benefit do you have in this? Because the person who becomes mutakabbir, he ends up going to the hellfire. He's worse than animals. 
This individual happens to be worse than animals because the Prophet ﷺ had informed us that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will resurrect the animals on the day of judgment as well and there will be qisas between animals. There will be justice that will be served between animals as well. And when they stand before Allah and the justice is served as the Prophet ﷺ, he said, لَتُؤَدُّنَّ الْحُقُوقَ حَتَّى يُقَادَ لِلشَّاتِ الْجَلْحَاءِ مِنَ الشَّاتِ الْقَرْنَاءِ You will give rights to one another for those rights that you have violated to a point that that sheep that doesn't have horns will have to, will, will end up receiving its rights from the animal that had horns and it struck it. But after all the rights have been granted to the appropriate animals, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will say, Kuni turaba, become dirt. And all of the animals, they will become dirt. So they will cease to exist, they will not go into hellfire. And they will not go into Jannah because they're not mukallafin. They're not addressed by the address of God. The people who happen to be addressed by the address of God are the ins and jinn, mankind and jinnkind. But animals are not, but they are resurrected by Allah to show the people that Allah is the ultimately just person. Allah is al-adil. Allah is the absolute just. And Allah is absolute justice. And He brings absolute justice. But after that, animals are gone. The person who has kibir, where does he go? He goes into the hellfire. So who's better now? The animal that served its justice and, it, and it's gone now and doesn't end up entering hellfire? Or a being who thought himself to be greater than other beings and now he's serving time in hellfire? So the person who believes himself to be greater than other people, immediately he render, renders himself even less than animals. My dear brother and my dear sister, the Prophet ﷺ, he said, in a hadith, he said, يُحْشَرُ الْجَبَّارُونَ وَالْمُتَكَبِّرُونَ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ On the day of judgment, those people who are arrogant, those people who are ruthless, they will be resurrected on the day of judgment in the form of small ants. في صورة الذر. Small ants. There are those ants that the naked eye can barely see. So he'll be transformed into an ant that the naked eye can barely see. And then the Prophet continued and he said, nas People on the day of judgment, they will be stepping on these people that happen to be arrogant because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cares not for a person who believes himself to be greater than other people who deems himself to be a greater individual than other people. The person who has that feeling that I am greater than X, Y, Z, immediately this person has rendered himself so, uh, so worthless in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. My dear brother, my dear sister. You see, there are two people. There's a person who makes a sin or who commits a sin because of a desire. And we can hope that the person who commits a sin because of a desire will come back to Allah. Rabbul Izzati wal Jalal. Because Adam, alayhi salam, his sin was that he ate from the forbidden tree. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had forbidden him. Shaytan whispered to him and he said that Allah hasn't forbidden you from this tree except that, illa an takuna malakaini aw takuna min al khalidin. Except that you end up, except that you'll become angels or you'll become eternal within this Jannah. So they fell prey to the trap of shaitan and to their desires. And they went for the tree. So that was a sin. But shaitan had another type of sin. His sin was due to arrogance. Allah told shaitan, what is causing you, O shaitan? Ma mana'ak? What's causing you not to Make sajda to the things, to this being that I've created with my own hands. He said, You created. No, he also said, I'm better than him. And you created him from fire, and you created me from clay. So, what's he saying over here? He's saying that his construct is greater than 
the human being. The material that is used to create him happens to be greater than the human being. The angle or the place from which he comes is greater than the human being. Right? And just like that, human beings also have a tendency of looking at one another and saying the same thing. They say that he is greater then, or I am greater than him because I come from this country and that culture and I come from here and I come from there. So I have now become greater in whatever way. And that is basically a satanic character. When people be begin to racially profile one another due to their race or due to their color or due to their, uh, th their lineage or due to whatever else, they're basically acting satanic and nothing more. And you see my brother and my sister, there are two traits then there are two reasons then that cause people to commit sins one of them there's a possibility that the person who does a sin like this may be forgiven because adam alayhi salam he made this mistake but at the end of the day he came back to allah azawajal. but shaitan he made this mistake but he kept on going further and further away from allah rabbul izzati wal jalal so arrogance is a sin that doesn't that that you don't hope for a person who's arrogant to come back to Allah. Unless his arrogance is completely crushed. And that's why Fir'aun, he starts off by saying, I cannot seem to find any ilah other than myself for all of you. But then he goes on and he says, Ana rabbukum al -a I'm your greater Lord. Because that arrogance, it starts taking him uphill. But a person who's committing sins because of his desires, he feels... Guilty internally, but he recognizes that he's making a mistake. He realizes that by committing this sin, I'm actually lesser than other people. I'm not greater than other people. So that person, you can hope that one day, that a nafs that he has, that's a lawama, that constantly tells him, and that constantly blames him, and tells him that, you know, you are committing a sin, oh you. And he completely feels guilty inside, even if externally he's expressing to people that I'm really happy with the life that I'm in. But that internal feeling will come, bring him back to Allah Rabbul Izzati wa Jalal. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us a nafs that always guilt trip us, trips us back to Allah Rabbul Izzati wa Jalal. Because that's a beautiful thing to be in. That's a beautiful station to be in. Yes, you're making a mistake, but at least you haven't internally died. You're still alive. And you still feel guilty about what you're doing. You see, that some people believe that you just have to completely be righteous. That's great. There are going to be among the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, those people who are sinless or very close to being sinless. Okay? But then there are those people, and those are the majority of us, that do make mistakes and do fall short. So long as our hearts are still telling us that you know you're making a mistake here, you got to get up and start patching yourself up again, then you're in a good position. You're in a good state. So don't let that feeling inside of you die. That's a nafs al-lawama, the nafs, the nafs that's telling you that you've got to come back to Allah, Rabbul Izzati wal Jalal. My dear brother and my dear sister, the reason why the person who has kibr doesn't enter Jannah, the reason for this is because he doesn't have the traits of a believer. How so? We know that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he told us in a hadith that. لا يؤمن أحدكم حتى يحب لأخيه ما يحب لنفسه. That none of you is completely a believer until he begins to love for his brothers what he loves for himself. Now a person that wishes to gain supremacy over other people, can he love for others what he loves for himself? He can't. Because he wants to be the person who has all greatness. He wants to be the person who has all accolade. He wants to be the person who has all recognition. So he can't love for other people what he loves for himself. He wants to have that feeling of being greater than everyone else in terms of his, his body, in terms of his wealth, in terms of his household, in terms of his job, in terms of his career, in terms of his looks, in terms of everything else, in terms of his knowledge, he wants to be greater than everybody else, so he can never love for other people what he loves for himself. And that's the reason why these people can't enter into Jannah, because they're not among the believers, in a sense, they're not among the, the supreme believers, they've left some of the muqtadayat al-iman, they've left some of the things that iman necessitates. And that's the reason why this person can't enter into Jannah. That is the reason. 
My dear brother and my dear sister, there are a number of reasons for takabbur. And within this you'll find yourself as well. And what I mean by that is, that within one of these, you're going to find that your nafs also feels greater than other people. My nafs also feels greater than other people. And those happen to be, and these are the primary ones. This doesn't mean it's limited to these. Anything, the, the, rule, the rule is, anything that a person can deem to be great, could be a reason that leads him to being a mutakabbir. Even though that thing may not be great in and of itself. Let me give you an example. For example, a person who drinks alcohol. People who are alcoholics, they sometimes boast to one another that I was able to have three bottles and four bottles and seven bottles and so on and so forth. And that <coughs> over the years I've developed so much tolerance to alcohol that I can have so many bottles, right? So that's something that they boast about. Is it something to boast about? But because they deem that to be great, they deem that action to be great, they may end up boasting about that. They may end up feeling greatness within their alcoholism. That's the reality. So the idea is anything that a person can conceive to be greatness, even if that is not greatness in and of itself, that can be used by that person to feel like he's mutakabbir. So now, this person who's boasting about his alcoholism, and he's talking about, out loud about all of this, that look, I'm able to have seven bottles and I can still you know, drive a car. That person has two sins now. Number one, he's an alcoholic. And number two, he's mutakabbir as well. Do you understand? There could be another person that has the same seven bottles, but he's not mutakabbir. He's sinful. That's a serious sin. It's a major sin to drink alcohol. But at the same token, the person is not committing another even greater sin. And that is a sin of arrogance. That is a sin of takabbur. So first and foremost, you have the mal. You have the wealth. This is one of the key reasons why people end up becoming mutakabbir. When a person has wealth, and when a person has loads and loads of money, when a person has a very large bank balance, when a person feels like they can buy whatever they want, when a person feels like they have the power to, to buy the system, they have the power to buy the, the loyalty of the greatest lawyers in the world, so any mistake they make, they can be pasted right over. When a person feels this, this ends up leading to a level of arrogance. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us of this in the Qur'an, as well when he said, إِنَّ الْإِنسَانَ لَا يَطْغَىٰ أَرْرَآهُ اسْتَغْنَىٰ That whenever man starts to feel like he's self-sufficient, he's got too much affluence, that's the moment he starts to become aggressive and transgressive and oppressive. That's the moment that the arrogance begins to kick in. So wealth is one of those factors. And the cure to this is that you make yourself realize that the only wealth you truly have will be that wealth that you actually use. Most people who are wealthy, they don't end up using all of their wealth within their lifetime, Right? The reality is, a lot of it just sits around and sometimes is donated to uh, charities and sometimes is donated to <coughs> people and sometimes it's left behind for heirs as well. But the only wealth that a person truly has is the wealth that he's exhausted. Either by granting it for the sake of Allah or in good uh, things or the person has used it for his personal life as well. Everything else, no matter how much you've earned, you don't really have it in a sense that you haven't actually used it. You haven't actually benefited from it. Okay? So that's one of the ways to recognize that. And the other way is to, to recognize that at the end of the day, no matter what you have, Allah is al-ghani. Allah is malik al-mulk. قُلِ اللَّهُمَّ مَالِكَ الْمُلْكِ تُؤْتِي الْمُلْكَ مَنْ تَشَاءُ وَتَنْزِعُ الْمُلْكَ مِنْ مَنْ تَشَاءُ وَتُعِزُّ مَنْ تَشَاءُ وَتُذِلُّ مَنْ تَشَاءُ بِيَدِكَ الْخَيْرِ إِنَّكَ عَلَى كُلِّ شَيْءٍ قَدِيرٍ O oh Allah, you are the owner of all kingdom. You are the owner of all ownership as well. You are the one who grants sovereignty to whomever you will, and you're the one who takes it away from whomever you will as well. You're the one who gives might to people. You're the one who gives stealth to people. You're the one who gives recognition to people. You're the one who gives izzah to people. And you also humiliate people. And you, O oh Allah, are capable of all things. So it is Allah that has given you wealth. It is Allah that is the absolute wealthy. Because your wealth is not really yours. It's going to become your children's. And you're going to die. 
six feet under, decayed, eaten alive by worms and other things. Everyone else is going to be benefit from, benefiting from what you earn. So that's the first reason why people end up becoming mutakabbir. Another reason is because of beauty. Beauty also leads people to arrogance as well. When people have been given a level of beauty, they end up feeling arrogance. They say, and they look at themselves and they look at their own beauty and they forget that it is Allah who has made them beautiful. It is Allah who has gave, given them good looks. It is Allah who has made them handsome. And that's why the Prophet ﷺ would always remind us to remember Allah. When you look in the mirror, you say, Allahumma anta hassanta khalqi fa hassin khuluqi. Oh Allah, you are the one who has beautified me. So also, beautify my character as well. Make me internally beautiful just as you made me externally beautiful. And animals, are happen there are animals that happen to be beautiful as well. If it's all about beauty, it doesn't change anything, real beauty, physical beauty. What really changes things is your internal beauty. Because when you go under the ground and you decay, you're going to be a skeleton like everybody else. There's going to be no difference in looks between a person that's six feet under that happened to be, you know, some of the most beautiful people in this world and some of the ugliest people in the world because all of them will be looking like skeletons and they'll look exactly the same. And so it's your inter internal beauty that will make you beautiful, that really renders you beautiful. It's your internal beauty that really con is considered. And that's why when you look at the mirror of the Prophet wasallam, he changed the narrative and he wanted you to think about the internal state. فَحَسِّنْ خُلُقِي So make my character beautiful as well. Oh Allah! And then there's strength as well. And there was a man by the name of Rukana in the time of the Prophet wasallam. He was very strong. He was very well built. He was very arrogant because of this as well. And it was his strength that was leading him to disbelief. So he tried. Allah's Prophet wasallam. he one day tried to give this man da'wah and the man wouldn't accept. So the Prophet wasallam told him, okay Rukana, then let's Let's go into a fight. Let's wrestle. So the Prophet ﷺ, he contested him to a wrestling match. Okay? And he pinned him once, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And Rukana thought that maybe I just slipped, something happened, you know? How can the Prophet ﷺ, this man, beat a person who is the elite wrestler of Arabia at that time? He's considered the undefeated champion of Arabia and perhaps the world at that time. So the Prophet pinned him in seconds. Because the Prophet ﷺ was the strongest man alive. And then he got up and he said, I want a rematch. So the Prophet ﷺ, he said, okay. Someone is contesting the Prophet. You think the Prophet doesn't have the courage to handle this? He said, okay. And he pinned him a second time. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And this man, again, he was in disbelief and he thought, it's impossible, how can this person end up taking me down so fast? And it's okay if you took me down, but I am the undefeated champion and this person doesn't have a track record in wrestling and he comes and takes me down within a second. And the third time he asks for a rematch again and the Prophet pins him a third time. Sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And so he crushed his ego and now it was time for him to believe. And the Prophet gave him da'wah again at this point. And that was part of the da'wah of the Prophet He recognized that this man, there's no way he's going to accept Islam so long as he has that ego within himself where he believes to himself to be so strong. I, the person who can defeat everybody, you want to tell me what to do? You want to tell me how to live my life? You want to tell me what's right and what's wrong? So sometimes strength ends up leading people to arrogance as well. And you know those macho men that walk in and they're like, you know, you can tell that they, there's arrogance going on over there and sometimes the body is also artificially moving like that. I understand when you're really bulky, the body ends up moving like that naturally, but there's a little bit of artificial, you know, walk like that as well, right? And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He talks about this walk as well, the, the swag in that walk. He talks about in Surah Al-Qiyamah. ثُمَّ ذَهَبَ إِلَىٰ أَهْلِهِ يَتَمَطَّى Then he went to his family, يَتَمَطَّى What, what does يَتَمَطَّى mean? الْمُطَى is your back. Right? And when people go like this, what do they do? They're bending their back in different directions. Right? So 
Allah is talking about this man, He says about this man, who is a disbeliever, who is an arrogant human being, who is a person whose arrogance has led him to disbelieve, Allah describes this man in that same walking fashion. Because the creation of Allah, time immemorial, has been doing the same thing. When they start to have strength and they have bodily power, they begin to feel like they're on top of the world and they're greater than everybody else. So that shows in the way they walk as well. And another reason why arrogance occurs within people is followership as well. Right? And in the past, this was largely because of kingdom. When you have a very large kingdom, what happens? You have followers because everybody in the kingdom must follow you. They must obey you. They're all your... Uh, they're all your people They're all the citizens of your country They are all your subjects As they call them So naturally they end up becoming all your followers But nowadays we have another form of followers as well People have followers on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram And so on and so forth And you have sometimes kids who haven't accomplished anything But you know they became that one hit wonder They did a small t- TikTok video and it just went viral and they went from zero to a million within overnight. So you can just imagine what this would do to an ego of a person, right? And so followership, that also brings ego within people. And that's why you have like, as I said, kids who haven't really accomplished anything within their lives as of yet, right? They don't really have any credentials. They don't really have real life knowledge. They don't have experience like adults as well. But because they get a little bit of fame, They have a lot of followers, they feel they have the right to comment on everything within the world. What is that? When you feel that you have the right to comment on everything within the world and you have the right to decide everyone, uh, whether they're right or they're wrong and you have the the right to look at information and decipher the right from the wrong without having any reasons to be justifiably doing that. That's arrogance. When you start to feel that you're on top of the world. Right? So these are the primary qualities that lead a human being to arrogance as well. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect us from arrogance. Allahumma ameen. My dear brother and my dear sister. You see, there is arrogance in the way people walk. There is arrogance in the way people look sometimes. You can see that arrogance in the looks of a human being. You can see it in the way human beings walk as well at times. You can see this arrogance in the way people sit. Sometimes even a sitting posture can tell you of the fact that a person is arrogant. The movements of a person's eyes can tell you sometimes of the fact that this human being happens to be an arrogant individual. The choices, the lifestyle decisions as well, they also tell you of the arrogance of of, of a person as well. Lifestyle decisions, they are one of the greatest signs that a person is arrogant. The Prophet ﷺ, he used to say that I'm just a slave. I'm a slave and I eat just as a slave eats. And the Prophet ﷺ, he would sit with the people. And that was the way the Prophet ﷺ was. He would sit with his people. He would walk ﷺ in some of the reports bare feet. And he would also tell his companions to walk outside bare feet. Hafiyan, without shoes. Why? Because the Prophet ﷺ wanted to teach people that it's not always about shoes. Now I'm not saying you go and walk outside in the cold right now bare feet and get yourself sick. But the idea is... That, of course, the Prophet is walking on sand, right? And uh, reasonably on on the right times as well. And he's walking and and it's safe. There's no glass. There's no people throwing bottles and and breaking on the street. So if you start walking on the street, now there's a potential that your feet are going to get affected. So if you see a clear ground, then go ahead and walk. Bare feet. This is a good practice. This is a practice of the Prophet ﷺ. I personally used to practice this whenever I saw the opportunity, especially when I was living in Saudi Arabia in the university, I knew that the area is very well looked after by uh, the cleaning crew. So there was no chance that there's going to be glass and there was no chance that there's going to be something that uh, ends up injuring your foot or so on and so forth. So I would walk back and forth from the masjid bare feet. People would say, why are you doing this? I would say, well, because Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam did it. And because he taught us to do it as well. Sometimes, not all the time. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam would go to the stores just like everybody else. Some people, they feel when they get a certain level of status within their religious circles, they feel that they are too 
Greater, they're greater than other people and they can't go to stores like everybody else. The Prophet used to go. Even though the kuffar of Quraysh, they found this as an opportunity to question the prophethood of the Prophet And they would say, وَقَالُوا مَا لِهَذَا الرَّسُولِ What's wrong with this Prophet? They questioned the Prophet because of this. يَأْكُلُ الطَّعَامِ He eats food. And what does he do? يَمْشِي فِي الْأَسْوَاقِ And he also goes around walking in the marketplace as well. So they started questioning the very prophethood of the Prophet. But this was the humanity of Rasulullah wasallam That he would do all the same things that everybody else had to do. Umar ibn Khattab, being the second greatest man, he would do the same thing. In fact, <coughs> he would go for his family <coughs> and he would buy meat for his family as well. And Ali ibn Abi Talib, he would go and buy dates for his family as well. He would go to the store on his own. And he would go and buy some dates for his family and he would come back and he's, as he's walking home, everybody knows this is the caliph. This is Ali ibn Abi Talib. This is the cousin of the Prophet. This is the son-in-law of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is the fourth caliph. This is one of the people of, the Jan- of Jannah by the witness of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And they would say, can I carry this on your behalf? Oh Ali. So Ali ibn Abi Talib, he would say that the father of children is more worthy of carrying their food. The father of, a chil- of children is more wor- worthy of carrying their food. And this is a message to the fathers. That you have a duty as well. All of these great men that we ever heard of, they were great fathers as well. They understood their responsibility as fathers. They understood that. They understood that they had to be the people who are the breadwinners of the family. They understood that they have to bring the food home as well. They understood that they have to look after their children's religious needs and education. They understood their responsibilities as a father. One of the greatest nasiha I can give you, my dear brother, is be a righteous father. Wallahi. Because Allah will look after your children if you happen to be a righteous father. And that is the reason why Allah looked after the children of that man within, the, within Surah Al-Kahf. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the only quality He told us about this man, He says, وَكَانَ أَبُوهُمَا صالحة. The reason why I did this, the reason why I looked after them, the reason why I preserved their wealth is because they had a pious father. When you are a righteous father, when you understand your responsibility as a father, then Allah will look after your children. Allah will look after your affairs then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will take care of you and your family. My dear brother and my dear sister, I'm going to leave you off with two things. The first of them is that the two ways in which you can inhibit this kibir, the two ways in which you can cure this kibir, the two ways in which you can rid yourself of this kibir, of this arrogance, the first of them is to recognize your own self. When you begin to recognize yourself, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will cure your kibir. How is that? Get to know yourself. You and I and everyone else, we've been created, as Allah says, from despicable, despisable, worthless fluid. Every single one of us, he comes out of the private part of his father. That's, what, that's a reality. As a drop of fluid that is completely worthless to any person of intellect. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He reminds human beings of this. Because this reminder is very important so you recognize that you're coming out of the same place that urine comes out of. And that Allah says, أَلَمْ نَخْلُقْكُمْ مِنْ مَاءٍ مَهِينٍ Did we not create you from worthless water? That's the worth of human beings. The start of human life, this is the worth of it. And Allah repeatedly reminds humanity of this within the Qur'an. So that all of us recognize that this is the worth of human beings. That if you were to be paid to drink this human, you wouldn't do it. You wouldn't do it. Because you understand that it is maheen, it is humiliating, it is maheen, it is despicable, it is maheen, it is worthless. That is the asl, that is the foundation upon which human life is built. Alam nakhlukum mimma immaheen. That's the first thing. And then, after that, what happens? 
Human beings travel between two passages of urine. Because after that, as the child is born and the fetus develops within the womb of the mother and it grows and grows and grows and grows, at the end of it all, again, the child comes out of the private part of the mother, the same place where urine comes and all sorts of other filth as well. And along with that child at that moment, there's a lot of filth as well. There's a lot of blood and najasat and filth and, and all sorts of things. This is the beginning of human life. This is the beginning of human life. And then what happens? Then this child grows and, and, and they're very vulnerable essentially. They're not able to eat, drink. They can't see even properly in the beginning of their lives. And as they grow older and older and older and as Allah grants this child strength and grants them more and more of power and all, uh, all of the qualities that human being, beings enjoy. The eyes to see with. The hands to strike with. The feet to walk with, the heart that beats, so the blood goes all across the body and circulates, the mind to think with. These powers, they start to make a person arrogant. And they start to feel like they themselves happen to be the great people. They are the greatest. They are the ones who are so great. But then, slowly as they grow older and older and they complete the cycle of life and they get to the epitome of the power, they start to now go downwards again. Now you have a hair that is completely black, you have a head of hair that is completely black, then the first white comes, and then the second one comes. And as the poet says, That the whiteness has now started to grow in his blackness, in the blackness of the hair, just as you see fire growing into firewood because it's one year after another and then the whole head has gone white by this time. That's it. And all of the strength that the person was enjoying, all of them start to fail on him. One strength after, after another, the eyes begin to become weak. The legs, they begin to become weak. The arms, they ache in different ways. The back is not as well as it used to be any longer. You can't sleep in the same way. You can't sleep in the same bed. You can't walk in the same shoes. You can't wear the same clothes. You can't come out bare feet anymore because you're too cold. You can't live without socks. And all of those problems, they just keep on piling up and they keep on becoming greater and greater. And they get to a point where a person is standing up straight and now they can't stand straight again. Doesn't that remind you of a child? A child who can't keep his neck up straight. But now when the when the being grows and he's an elderly, also he can't keep his neck up straight any longer. All of those powers and strengths and all of those abilities, they've been taken away and they finish. And then finally, the person dies and that's if they live to see that day. Because many people are going to die before you. And the proof for that is if you look around you, how many elderly do you see? People sometimes have this hope that we're going to live to grow to... Uh, older ages and so on and so forth. But if you look around you in humanity, how many old people do you actually see? Most people that you see are your age or younger or older, but the really elderly people are not around you because something is going to cause someone to die along the path. So you might not live to, to the age of haram. You might not live to your 80s or your 90s or so on and so forth. You might not even live to your 60s or 70s. You might die in your 50s. You might die in your today. So if you get to live to that point and everything becomes weakened, now you're six feet under and you start to decay and you become food for, for what? Worms and insects. And you're eaten by things that you wouldn't eat yourself. This is the circle of life. But the problem is that we only see the now. We don't see the beginning of life and we don't see the end of life. You started off as filth, as Allah says, ma mahin worthless water, and at the end of it, when you die, you become a corpse that is also filthy as well because now it's mixed up with all sorts of uh, pus and it's mixed up with all sorts of other things that is food for the soil and that is food for, for worms as well. My dear brother and my dear sister, this is the reality of life. When you recognize that, then you recognize that you yourself are worth absolutely nothing. I'll give you one example. If you really want to recognize your own worthlessness and how minuscule you are in the grand scale of things, think about the last time you got on an airplane. When you get on top of an airplane and you start flying, essentially, 
You see people when you're one minute into flight. And then as the plane goes higher and higher, you see people still, but they become smaller. And as it grows higher and higher in altitude, as it flies higher and higher in altitude, there's going to be just about four or five minutes before you can't see a single human being anymore. And now you might be able to see buildings, you see cars, but human beings are slowly fading away. And as you fly further, human beings are completely gone. And even those cars that you thought to be grand, they're gone. And the buildings that you thought to be grand, they're also gone. And now you just see a flat plane. And soon enough, as you go above the, the clouds or into the clouds, you can't even see that flat plane anymore. So now, does your entire existence start to become minuscule in your mind as well? Because that's the reality of life. <coughs> and this is you still within the atmosphere of the, of the earth. If you were to go further into the galaxy, then that's it. Now the earth that you thought was so grand becomes just a dot in all of the galaxy. And if you go further and you are out of the galaxy and you're in another galaxy and you're in the universe somewhere else, then what happens? Then even that entire galaxy becomes absolutely nothing. So the reality is that you and your existence and me and my existence is very, very minuscule in the grand scale of things. If you would like to put it this way, we're not even a dot within the existence that Allah has created. Literally, literally, and I'm not exaggerating when I say this, me and you and all of us in this room put together do not even equate to a dot within the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when you recognize how minuscule you are, when you recognize how worthless you are, when you think of your beginning and you think of your ending as well, that will get rid of that kibar. Because you'll actually understand who you really are. You'll, you'll understand your essence within the rest of the universe. You'll understand your role within the rest of this world. And that's why Allah says, and now you understand the meaning of this as well, that وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ Every other role that you thought was great, is not a worthwhile role. I've only created human beings for these two roles. This role. And that is what? To worship Allah. That has a new meaning now because you've recognized who you are and I've recognized who I am. The second way for us to purify and cleanse ourselves of arrogance is to recognize Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The more you recognize Allah, the more you'll purify yourself of arrogance. When you recognize that Allah is Al-Jabbar, Allah is Al-Qahar, when you recognize that Allah is the Almighty, Allah is Al-Aziz, when you recognize that Allah is Al-Mutakabbir, Allah is the one to whom all greatness and supremacy belongs, when you recognize that Allah is Al-Akbar, He is the greater and greatest, when you recognize that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the ultimate. When you recognize that there's nothing that happens within this earth except that it is through the will of Allah, the more you recognize Allah, the more you recognize how worthless you are. The more you recognize Allah, the more you recognize your need to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The more you recognize the grants of Allah and the bounties of Allah, the more you understand your need to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as well. Look at the creation of Allah, the signs of Allah, look at the stars, that's how you recognize Allah. The Prophet ﷺ, he told us in a beautiful hadith, he says, تَفَكَّرُوا فِي آلَاءِ اللَّهِ وَلَا تَفَكَّرُوا فِي اللَّهِ Think about the bounties of Allah. Think about the blessings of Allah. Think about the signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And don't think about Allah Himself because maybe your mind, it's finite. It's not going to be able to recognize Allah in the, in the way that Allah really is. But those signs that are finite just like yourself, you'll be able to see them in a way that you won't be able to perceive Allah perhaps. So look at those signs. Look at the mountains and the stars and look at the water as it flows. Look at the animals. Go out in nature. Go and walk within the earth and look at all the signs of Allah and, and the marvels that Allah has placed within this creation. That will make you understand Allah. That will make you understand that Allah has created this life and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has perfected this life of, of all of the different people within the ecosystem. Of all of the different animals and everyone that's involved within the system that Allah has created of life. When you see that, my brothers, that is going to protect you from kibr. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow us to recognize our own status. 
and to recognize the status of Allah Rabbul Izzati wal Jalal. And to recognize our need for Allah. Allah says in the Quran, Ya ayyuhan, ya ayyuhan nas, antumul fuqara'u ila Allah. O oh people, you yourself are only the ones who happen to be in need of Allah. Wallahu huwa al ghaniyul hamid. And Allah is ever affluent. Allah is ever sufficient. Allah is the one who suffices. Allah is the rich and He is the praiseworthy one in the fact that He granted you as well. So when you've been granted, it is Allah who should be praised for that grant. So I praise Allah Rabbul Izzati wal Jalal for every bounty that He has bestowed us with. Allahumma ameen. I say Alhamdulillah, all praise is due to Allah. That Allah has granted us with eyes and bestowed us eyes. And He's given us hands. He's given us legs to walk with. He's given us a mind to think with. I praise Allah for the fact that He's given us life. I praise Allah that Allah has given us functional faculties. I praise Allah that He's given us peace and serenity. I praise Allah Rabbul Izzati wal Jalal and thank Him for every bounty that He has bestowed us with. And I say that Allah is the one who has granted us every single bounty and that we are deserving of none of this were it not to be for the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in.